from the Club of Minnesota, and this has been a wonderful partnership with the McCarthy Center because uh, we'll have guests speaking at the Economic Club of Minnesota, and then they'll come up uh, on campus, and today is exactly that situation. So we're very pleased uh, to have both of you, and let me just uh, invite Mark to come up to the podium. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate everybody being here, and there's probably nothing that we're going to be talking about that is more important to you and your futures. As I have a daughter graduating this year, and if those who graduated last year and this year, the job right out there is very, very, very tough. So the question is, how do we make it better for you, for your future graduates from St. John's, St. Ben's? And we are really in a global world. And I give presentations every now and then on how to compete in the global world. And one of the signs I show is, you know, the, the opposition is not the other party. The opposition is whatever it takes for us to get done to get, be competitive in this increasingly global world where, where we have to compete with everyone. And what's unique about our speaker here today, and we, we, she did speak at the Economic Club, but she also met with the head of uh, University of Minnesota and senior leaders at Medtronic and General Mills and Excel and several of the other business leaders because her organization pulls together the CEOs of those corporations with the university presidents, with the labor leaders, helps come up with solutions that can be effective, that can be supported by both sides of the aisle to move our country in a more competitive way. One of her most recent uh, efforts for her organization created the Compete Act, which is, as she jokingly says, the last bipartisan thing that ever passed uh, through Congress. And we hope there are more. Uh, it brings a wealth of uh, wisdom on that, on innovation, and what it takes to be competitive. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Deborah Wynn Smith. Thank you, Mark. And let me also reiterate um, the tremendous appreciation that we all feel for your service to our country as a distinguished congressman. And, um, you know, you are unique, too, in bringing together the business experience, the public policy, and now doing both of those, you know, the leadership of bringing together important constituencies here in Minnesota, but also reaching out in the world. So thank you for inviting me to come to Minneapolis and speak today at the Economic Club and, and then now come to St. Ben's, St. John's. Um, we were just talking a little bit before uh, the lecture started about I went to the oldest women's college in the United States uh, when it was purely women's Vassar. And, you know, we were founded back in uh, 1850, actually, by a brewer, Matthew Vassar, and produced the first woman uh, astronomer, Maria Mitchell, who uh, actually was quite a distinguished astronomer. And so uh, I'm very interested in to see at this time how you are melding together the distinct uh, identity of St. Ben's but also with St. John. So you're merging together, but you're not um, taking away the unique uh, features of each of your important uh, institutions. And President, it's very nice to have you as well. Thank you for all your leadership. So I'm gonna very briefly talk about, um, you know, the reshaping of the competitive global landscape and why an innovation imperative for the United States is really what we need to do as a nation to ensure that we have productivity growth we increase the standard of living and prosperity for all our citizens. Our companies are successful in the global economy. And we also maintain our national security leadership and responsibilities. You know, this is an era, um, I kind of call it the three T's, an era of turbulence, of transition, and transformation. And I'm sure many of you in this room, who being at, at great liberal arts colleges, have studied a lot of history. And you know, of course, that there are certain times in the millenniums when we have been uh, humans creating our cultures of, of real shifts, tectonic shifts. And we are actually in one of these periods of a tectonic shift where we've left the industrial age and we've really moved into an age of innovation. And this is why we do have a lot of stress and turmoil and dislocation. And we're seeing a lot of the uh, industrial activity that fueled not only our economic growth, but the growth of the world in the 20th century, really becoming something else. And, um, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm proud about in terms of the United States is 
we have what, you know, the famous economist uh, Schrumpter talked about, creative destruction. And I think all of us know in our personal lives as well as in our business lives, sometimes you have to shut a door in order to open a new door. And if you don't shut that door, you never get into the future. And unlike some other parts of the world, and I'll just say Europe, where some European colleagues said this to me, you know, the difference between the United States and Europe is we're spending a lot of our time trying to buffer and protect and keep the economic activity of the past while you're more focused on building the future. And that really is at the heart of our competitiveness agenda. You know, we, we have some of these great transformational shifts underway. I'm going to mention them very, very quickly, but, you know, the whole digital revolution and global network communications have just brought an unprecedented integration of not just national economies, but of course the global economy, so that information, capital, know-how, technology, talent, they flow across national borders as, as never before. Um, you know, the emerging economies, whether you want to call them the BRICS or whatever, these emerging economies that 20 years ago competed on natural resources and low-skill commodity goods, not only have they moved up the economic development curve, they've shattered it, and they are now, many of them, fully integrated into global value chains. They are investing in advanced research and development, making the strat strategic decisions of how to have a highly skilled workforce, and they're becoming increasing favored locations of foreign direct investment, from China and India to Brazil, and I would say Russia not as much, but, but, but clearly China, India, and Brazil is what are really poised um, in, a, in a very significant transformational way. And these emerging economies, um, just in one generation, have doubled their shares of uh, exports, imports, and again, foreign direct investment. And by 2020, this is a really important thing to think about, 80% of all middle class consumers in the world will be outside the developed world. So these consumers that, you know, consumers are increasingly king, they have power, they have discretion, they have money. They are going to be our customers, our partners, and our competitors. So how we all go forward and work together while still maintaining our own national identities and standards of living is going to be, again, a challenge but a great opportunity. Uh, multinationals have now morphed into global enterprises where they're optimizing their investments and activity all over the world. Uh, IBM's a good example of that. They've now re relocated their, one of their service hubs and some of their key software development in India. General Electric just announced last week putting a major research and development center in um, Brazil. Uh, Applied Materials, which is a you know, uh, California silicon uh, uh, semiconductor company that makes a lot of equipment for fabrication of semiconductors. They're now big in solar cells, and they actually have their chief technology officer based in China. So these, that just gives you a little indication that global enterprises are really making the decision what provides the best environment for the innovation, being close to customers, and developing the demand-driven products that will fuel um, their economic success. And so, you know, we look at global trade very differently. It's no longer just about things cutting across borders. It's, you know, this concept of production slicing and where you fit in in the global supply chain of value. So, you know, many of you know the example of the iPod. It's, it's a fairly common one now. But, you know, the iPod is assembled in China. And um, not the iPod, the iPhone and the iPod. And I, I, I have to confess, I'm backwards, so I don't have either one. My kids do. But um, the actual value is in about three components. The design, of course. Components being one made in Japan, two in the United States and the economic value of the product being assembled in China, in this case, is very, very low. So if you look at that as a manufacturing um, product, you can see that the actual final making of the thing doesn't tell the whole story of the production slicing and how this comes to be. And then, of course, the value for the iPhone and now the new iPad is really going to be on all the applications that they put on top. So that again, you know, it's changing business models, changing industries. Um, the other thing that's, that's really unprecedented in human history is 
We have 24-7 global labor arbitrage. Enterprises overnight can shift where they're doing their work and shut down where they're doing their work. It's unprecedented. You know, they can decide overnight, you know, we're going to put a new call center there, we're going to do this, and this is happening. And so, you know, this means that when work is routine and rule-based and it can be digitized, there's going to be a low-cost place to do this work in the world and compete for those jobs. So, you know, a, 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 an economist recently wrote a book, and one of his lines that I thought was very interesting one is, everyone is competing everywhere all the time for everything <laughs> in the world. And, you know, also then another shift that relates to this is the multipolar science and technology world where we used to in the United States account for more than two-thirds of global R&D. Now, two-thirds of global R&D is performed outside of the United States. Now, we still are a huge, huge investor and player in R&D. I mean, we spend more on R&D, let's not forget this, than France, the UK, Germany, and Japan combined. But others are growing, and so the issue is, what R&D do we perform here, and how does it relate to these new value creations? Um, and then, you know, what do these shifts mean for America? And, and, and before I get to that, let me just add a couple things. On the global front, global geopolitical shifts, well, we're, we have demographics. You know, the United States, this is really important, we are the only advanced, developed nation in the world that has a growing population of young people. We do have some demographics, you know, of an aging workforce right now, but we have young people and our population's growing. Countries like, you know, Japan, France, many of the European countries have huge problems in terms of not even replicating their current population. That is a strategic advantage for the United States. But, you know, the, the world is going to be very much dominated by young people. And the other demographic change is that people are leave, moving from countrysides at rapid pace to live in cities. You, know, you look at a city like Sao Paulo in Brazil, you know, 13 million people. I don't know if any of you have been there. It's just an, a mind-boggling place to think of living there, the infrastructure, the electricity. You can't even move in the city when you have to go to the airport. So the whole challenges of urbanization are huge, and they're going to cause tremendous innovation opportunities. We're also, in the global world, dealing with this intersection of energy security, the movement from a fossil to a low carbon world, environmental stewardship, and climate change, and how all those things interact together. And one of the pieces of the work the Council's done over the last three years that culminated in a big national summit and also a call to action for the Copenhagen Climate Talks was to really look at the intersection of energy and climate as an economic development opportunity and to think in terms of abundance and not scarcity. And that is something I, you know, a couple ideas I leave you with, you know, a lot of the thinking in the more traditional environmental community, and you know, this is even coming out in organic farming that's now actually being shown in scientific terms to produce more carbon footprint than, up, than, than not. But you can't progress if you think of the world in a scarcity way. And it's really against human nature to do that. That doesn't mean that you're wasteful and all of that, but we need to think of these challenges and how we turn them around in a positive way. And then, of course, food. Food and water are going to be the two national security and economic issues of the future. Now, how many in this room know who are the two largest food production and export nations in the world? You're not allowed to answer. But <laughs> in Brazil, huge producers, exporters, dot, you know, and continuing to grow. Now, how many of you follow the news when the uh, Doha round of trade liberalization talks collapsed a couple years ago? Did anybody remember? Did you, this was a shift. The BRIC countries, Brazil, India, and China, Russia again wasn't so much in this, they broke their alliance against the so-called developed countries of the trade negotiations. 
what was the issue that splintered it? Agriculture. And it was very upsetting to the Brazilian government because what they finally had to realize was their economic interests and abilities assets were aligned with the United States in agriculture, not with India and China that were blocking imports and putting huge tariffs on them. So this issue of food and water, not only because of climate change and biotechnology, all of these things, they're going to be huge issues for the future. So you know, when you think of some of the things you want to get involved in in your career or your study, it's not just being a technologist, but to understand the social sciences around this, you know, the cultural issues. Um, I've learned a lot just recently on food. For instance, I did not know that the main food stock in many parts of Africa is a grain called sorghum. Now, I didn't know that sorghum has absolutely no nutritional value and no protein. So as people develop, they have to have, and we want them to have protein-based diets. So the only way to produce some of these new grains that are going to have the vitamins, the protein, is going to be through genetic engineering. Otherwise, people are going to starve. But that's, it brings up a whole set of things. So food and water and the need to double food production by 2050, absolutely huge, huge issues. So in the United States, you know, compete on low wage, commodity products, commodity services, routine technology development. We have to be innovators. And excellence in science and technology is not enough. That's just part of the equation because many other nations are building this up. And also, a lot of the knowledge and technology becomes a commodity very, very quickly. It moves very quickly in our network world. So the real issue is, what do you do with this knowledge? What do you do with this science and technology? How do you look at it? How do you think of a way that you, you provide a solution and do something that's never been done before to create value? That's what innovation is really about. So the rewards go to those who are very creative and can think of a new way of looking at the world and producing new products based on those assets. So we have to out-imagine, we have to out-create in order to out-compete and to maintain our standard of living and also contribute to global growth. Um, another very important transition, you know, there are different times to get in human history of scientific revolutions. We're in one right now. And the revolution is a merger of three areas. The biotechnological revolution, the digital re revolution, and you know, you all are leading that. I mean, we're totally moving to wireless communications. And the nanotechnology revolution. But what's occurring is they're merging. And it's at the intersection of these three disciplines where unbelievable things are happening. They're going to all, this is going to alter every industry. It's going to drive new business formation, new markets, and it's going to be very disruptive, too. Nanotechnology is really interesting because, you know, you're looking at how to make and use and manipulate materials at the subatomic level and then all the way up to huge extreme systems. And, you know, the material side, this is huge, but also in you know, structural things, in the clean energy revolution, nanotechnology is playing a very big role, as well as in medicine and medical devices. You know, I, I had the opportunity yesterday to go to Medtronic and you know, just to see the things they've developed there. You know, came out of University of Minnesota, you know, fabulous example of demand-driven innovation in emerging fields, but you know, I didn't know that Medtronic really is developed as a leader themselves in miniature batteries. You know, and in the whole wireless things that they've created. But you know, in nanotechnology and some of these, uh, micro, they're called NEMS, they're going to actually be little tiny uh, micro devices that will actually, instead of a catheter, they're going to go in and actually clean out their arteries and do all these things as little working machines in the next generation of medical devices. Now, nanotechnology is not new. And we have a wonderful uh, demonstration of nanotechnology here at St. John's, St. Ben's, that I had the chance to look at for five minutes. Thomas um, Kennedy, next time more. <laughs> but I, I had the chance actually to see the St. John's Bible. And being an archaeologist, I was thrilled to see it. And what a
was really interesting, you know, that reproduction, um, what they're doing of, of the uh, monastic painting and calligraphy and doing it completely as it was done by the scholar monks, is that there's a lot of evidence now that the monks in um, Lindisfarne in Ireland, and the, they created the Book of Kells and others, they actually were in Egypt. And they spent quite a bit of time with Byzantine artists. And many of the colors, particularly the cobalt blue, the beautiful blue, was developed by Egypt, but they refined it. And that cobalt blue and the pigmentation is an example of nanotechnology. So um, I just wanted to share that with you because this is not something new, but it's going to a next level of evolution, and you have a wonderful demonstration of it here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about biomimicry. You know, that's again how we're looking at how we can mirror nature in order to create and innovate. And just one, a couple of examples that are great. Qualcomm has this new display that um, mimics the way the butterfly wings um, and peacock feathers call light, cause light to interfere with itself, um, creating all these shimmering colors. And then there's a little company called Sharplet Technologies that is producing antimicrobial films that are used for cleaning products in hospitals, because you know infection rates in hospitals are a huge problem. But they've done this by um, looking at the tiny diamond shapes arranged in a pattern that mimic the microbe resistant properties of shark skin. Who would have ever dreamed that it's the shark skin that's providing the model and the natural uh, organization that can be applied to this type of a product. So, you know, going forward, we could talk about, you know, biofuels and so many of the things that are underway in energy. I do want to mention manufacturing. Manufacturing is very misunderstood now. And uh, as a Japanese colleague said to me many years ago, you know, we have to do something about manufacturing. Get over the four Ds. And I was joking with Mark, you know, I didn't know what those four Ds are. <coughs> well, dirty, dumb, dangerous, and disappearing. Manufacturing is not any of those things. Manufacturing is a whole enterprise from idea and concept, the research and development, the design, the actual way things are going to be made with self-assembly of materials, things that are totally sustainable. DuPont's making a carpet. You can buy it at um, uh, Home Depot. It's made out of corn-based polymers where you feed uh, a uh, insect, a type of uh, ethanol sugar, and it makes this stuff and produces this carpet that's more stain resistant and degrades instead of the uh, fossil base. It's also the capital cost structures, regulations, this whole enterprise. And this part of the nation is so much at the heart of not just the innovation today, but the future, that I urge all of you to think in your work that, that you could have a role to play in this renaissance of 21st century manufacturing which is essential for our jobs, essential for our innovation, and essential for our national security. And in order to do that, you really do have to have your liberal arts education. And I hope here at these two uh, colleges that you do have to take enough science and math and engineering so you have a grounding in that. But you do so where you also have the humanities and social sciences embedded around that. Those are the types of skill sets for the creative, conceptual thinkers and doers of the future. The people that will be entrepreneurs that will think of things in a new and different way. And let me just conclude by saying that, you know, when I think of innovation, and we, you know, if we went around the room, if we had a spot quiz, now I probably don't do that anymore, but if we had a spot quiz, I bet everybody in this group would define innovation in a different way. What does it mean? What is innovation? Well, we spent a lot of time at the Council on Competitiveness to define it. We, we came up with a definition that we love. And we, we say that innovation, beginning with the letter I, is I the fifth power. And it's the intersection of ideas, 
on this journey to create value, to understand our world, and shape it in a way that's going to solve the grand challenges of our time, our children's time, and ensure that every human has a better opportunity to grow and succeed and contribute. And you know, one of the things that I would say in conclusion is that you're all very fortunate to be in an environment here. In addition to scholarship and inquiry, you have a spiritual overlay on what you're doing. And that is something that's becoming increasingly rare. It should be, in my view, much more the common than the exception. Because at the end of the day, we are humans and we're spiritual beings. And so the innovation around all of that is something that you have a very special responsibility to lead on coming out as graduates from St. Ben's and St. John. So thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you very much for coming. I'm going to address this wonderful audience today. My name is Valentin Sierra and I am a political science major with a little bit of a background in economics as that, was, as that is my minor and I'm from Colombia. Um, and um, I know about a study called Effective Education for Employment that Pearson Company um, developed in 2008 um, and was in translation for Latin America um, last summer, and in that study, they seem to address the issue that the current academic system in the United States is not addressing the issue of soft, skill and soft skills and transferable skills as it should be doing, and there is a critical disconnect between the needs of the business world and the skills that uh, academia is providing. So that seems to be a little bit um, it seems to be a little bit different to what you were saying that um, the liberal arts education seems to be a component. Well, the report seems to disagree with it. Now, I'm not saying that the report is right or that you're right, but what do you think about the disconnect that they seem to point out? Well, actually, I'm aware of that work, and um, it's actually very accurate, and I will say that what I was talking about with liberal arts feeds into that very much because. The soft skills, what are the soft skills? You know, and I, I, I'm sure the older people in the room here can attest to this. You know, one, you know, they're the ability, you have to have judgment, you have to have insight, you have to have situational awareness, you have to be able to make decisions without being rash, you have to also, in so many dimensions of life, see the interconnection between things to connect the dots. And the one thing I would say in our educational system at the you know, university level is it is still too stovepipe. You don't have as much of a cross-fertilization across disciplines. That is something we need to improve and change. And there, there are some places that are doing it, but you know, the classic model, you know, the chemistry, the physics, the English departments, they don't allow for that type of interdisciplinary learning. Um, also, I think problem-based learning and solution-based learning and the types of projects that many uh, innovative schools are now requiring is also getting to this uh, new type of learning that gives uh, the type of skill set in the soft area. Um, another is leadership and ethics. And I don't know how many schools teach that anymore or have courses on it. They used to. Uh, our military academies do. But at the end of the day, you know, I mean, I'll just tell you my work when I was a government official. Your word was everything. You know, when you went in, when I went in as a senior official to a very contentious interagency meeting, you know, State Department, Congress, you know, all these, and I made a commitment and said I was going to do this, or my boss was, if I did not carry through the leadership and ethics behind that, I basically couldn't play the next. And we're seeing in our business. 
uh, Minister Plata, the Minister of Industry and Trade there is a good friend. Colombia is a country that is on the move. You know, it's a dynamic country. It has creativity. It has design. It's doing very interesting things in some advanced technology areas. What's one of their great innovations that changed the flower world? One, they got rid of the middlemen. But the most important thing, they innovated in order to keep the shelf life of roses from the time they were cut to the time they get to our homes through the supermarket or whatever, almost a month. They revolutionized the flower market. That's a fabulous example of innovation. And it was need driven. How do we get these flowers that were cheaper to produce, but how do we get them to the consumer for them to last? So anyway, I'm glad to hear you're from Colombia and um, you have a great country. Thank you. That, that's a different perspective from the drugs. Thank <laughs> 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 You said we have to double the production of food by 2020. No, 2050. 2050, oh good. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about water? I mean, you said uh, Brazil and, um, and the United States produce the food. Where is the water? Well, water is the other huge issue. And water shortage, I mean, I, I have in my notes the actual number of people that do not have potable water in this world. It's huge. And of course, waterborne disease, you know, even in a country like India, you know, that's developing rapidly, you know, they have still the highest incidence of childhood and, and young adulthood um, intestinal diseases because of water and the bacteria. So water is a huge issue. Where's the water coming from? Well, obviously Canada in North America is a huge player vis-a-vis -vis water. But the new chairman of the Council on Competitiveness, Sam Allen, the CEO of Deer, he was recently with us. He said, and I, didn't, I got it wrong, he said, what country in the world has the largest supply of fresh water? No. Canada? You're going there soon. Yeah. Russia. Russia. How many knew that? You did. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, water will be a national security issue. And then, of course, you know, you add to it the climate change issues and you know, the potential flooding and drought. I mean, all of those things. And uh, it's interesting, in Saudi Arabia, they have a new uh, King Abdullah University for Science and Technology. One of the main areas they're doing research on is water. And at the University of Minnesota, I learned yesterday, you have one of the most important water research institutes in the world. Here in your own backyard, so. Um, I have a question. My name's Anna, and I'm an economics major. And I'm wondering, you brought up the Doha round, and so I wanted to go back to that because one of the issues that has continuously stalled talks within the WTO and other economic bodies in the world is this issue of subsidies and agricultural subsidies. So within the United States and developing world, we're blessed with abundant economies where we can pay our farmers higher prices, which then artificially raise the world price on these products and make it artificially cheaper, like give us an artificial competitive edge on growing. So I'm wondering, in your perspective, is it realistic for us to continue um, subsidizing our food? Well, I'm of the view, and most economists are, that subsidies, no matter what they are, is, are not good. They distort the market. Mm -hmm. So the fact of it is, we do have a very deep politically driven subsidy system in this country for agriculture. The Europeans are worse, but you know, we're after that. It is. And if we pay the highest in the world for sugar, I mean, is that something we really ought to be subsidizing? Sugar? Well, I guess the sugar beet farmers in certain parts of the country they think so. But but clearly, you know, the United States in our position has made a lot of concessions on that even more so than the Europeans. But what was going on with Brazil, India, China was it was really, you know, the give and take. Um, their subsidies and their huge tariffs on industrial products were to move as we moved down on the others, and they did. <coughs> and I'll give you another example of Brazil. You know, Brazil produces, um, we're, we're, we're actually still the largest producer in the world of ethanol. But our ethanol 
is corn-based, which is not productive. Again, it takes water, it takes land. You know, there are a lot of next generation biofuels that are, that are being developed, um, cellulosic and others, and um, we're moving on. But you know, the corn was subsidized. We had requirements for renewables, which increased you know, the corn and land. But anyway, Brazilian ethanol, sugarcane ethanol, is cheaper, doesn't take as much water, it's better. Now, some of my Brazilian friends, when we did our summit with them in 2007, said, well, one of the things we have to do, we need a statement that says that the U.S. will get rid of all our tariffs on ethanol. You know, it's, it's better. I said, yes, that's a great idea. Let's do that. But why do we have in our declaration that the two countries are committed to reducing all tariffs? End of discussion. <laughs> they have huge high tariffs on, you know, whether it's computers, blah, blah, blah. So that's part of this challenge. And we've gone a long way, but I, 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 I mean, Congressman Kennedy will know better than I do on the political <coughs> side of this, but the agricultural subsidy of the Farm Bill was huge, and um, I'd like to see it come down. <laughs> well, even a few weeks ago, um, Congressman Colin Peterson, who's right, our next door neighbor, basically, he said that he'd love to see the United States lift the trade ban with Cuba, and then about half an hour later, the same day, said, but only as long as we raise the quota on sugar, because all the sugar beet farmers are in his district. So he's going to protect the sugar beet farmers, but also somehow want us to be selling sugar to Cuba, even though their sugar is cheaper. So that's, I don't know, a completely like, mismatch. Well, a lot of the issues with Haiti, you know, are related to some of these things, too. Uh, I also was a former U.S. trade representative for local years, and he actually played a very important role in you know, getting um, tariffs reduced for Haiti. And I don't know if you know Haiti produces a lot of baseballs. But there was a lot of protection in this country, but not a lot of Haitian baseball. So, you know, we, we are as guilty as some of the others. I mean, our cotton subsidy is bad, and the Brazilians are retaliating against us. So, thank you for your question. And I, you should come and intern at USTR. Um, my name is Corey Baldwin. I'm a sophomore and uh, economics major. And um, after hearing what you've talked about, um, I think you've you said that we are in an age where innovation is more key than it's ever been done before, as compared to industrialization. Um, my question for you is: in this era of like sectionalist protectionism, like in our own economy sectional interests vying for control and, and uh, what we would call crony capitalism perhaps, um, that our main objective should be to design an economy where we have incentives and the right conditions for entrepreneurs to create the sort of innovation that, that you want to do. Like that seems to be the general goal. You know, it, it's good to say that everybody needs to be an entrepreneur and come up with these right. ideas, but the, the main object is to create the environment to do so. So how do we, how do, we do that? Well, some of the answers, you know, to that are not ones you might want to hear. But right now, our entrepreneurs, you know, the small startup companies, as well as those that employ 50 to 100 people are being crippled. They have incredible amount of regulatory burden. They have a tax structure and a tax burden that is making their capital cost structure totally uncompetitive. You know, we have the second highest corporate tax rate in the world. I don't know how many of you know that. Uh, look at some companies that want to continue to build and do their stuff here. When you go through the economics, you know, they're basically saying, well, in order to do it here, we're talking about a 40% differential in cost. So we have to, on the entrepreneurial side, really recognize that the risk that's involved and the risk capital and all the things that you need to build and grow a business relate to the regulatory and fiscal environments. This state, um, Congressman Kennedy told me this, that this state has the third highest, uh, what, corporate tax rate? Now, yeah, it can be amortized a little bit, but, you know, that again has an impact on a lot of your entrepreneurs, I understand, doing something here and then moving over to Wisconsin. So you've got to look at this whole, and you, you know, you have great economic development people here in St. Cloud. So, 
maybe you all together could, you know, kind of put together the roadmap of the things you need and, you know, go do a presentation before your legislature, you know, that comes out of the colleges and universities of what we need to stimulate the entrepreneurial economy here. Um, and, you know, another thing, product liability. I don't know how many of you know what that is and tort issues, but we want to have a culture and we want products that are safe. You know, we have high standards for pharmaceuticals and medical devices. Everyone complains about the Food and Drug Administration, but believe me, for those of you who travel around the world, when you need a medicine and you need a device, the majority of people want American products. Why? Well, one, they know they're safe and they've been tested. They've not been adulterated. They've not been watered down. All of that stuff. So having high standards is very good for us in a competitive way. But on the product liability side, our tort laws, which are costing now over 2% of our GDP, are basically taking whole areas of economic activity out of this country. There are certain chemicals, a lot of things that companies will not even make here because of our triple damage li liability law. So we want to develop the next generation of lithium batteries for electric vehicles. I'm sorry to say they probably won't be done here because of tort. And that's where we have to get a consensus between business, academia, and labor to come together around these things and not have them treated in partisan um, kind of knee-jerk reaction. So it's a whole set of things that impact the entrepreneurship. Let's give it one more round.